On October 13, 1996, LAPD crash unit officer Rafael Perez and his partner Nino Durden were staking out an area in Los Angeles when they entered an abandoned apartment where they found two homeless guys, one named Nini and the other named Javier Rondo, who was a known 18th Street gang member at the time. They let Nini go, but they kept Ivano there and started questioning him for information about his gang and the criminal activities that the gang was involved in. While talking, things quickly escalated. As Ivando, he refused to give up any information. So a frustrated Perez put out his Beretta and shot him in the chest at almost point blank range, followed by his partner, Nino Durden, firing a shot into him as well. Perez then lifted Ivando off the floor by the front of his shirt and fired around into the side of his head. The corruption gets so deep that they had a secret radio code that let other dirty cops know about the shooting in order for the shooters to get their stories together. Yeah, real gang shit. They planted a gun next to Ivando and said he ran in an apartment with the intent to kill, so they had to shoot him. This deadly scenario was only one of many that Crash Unit was responsible for throughout the 1990s, which accumulated to be the Rampart scandal. Yeah, bank robberies, the theft and sale of a lot of cocaine, and even gang-like means of operations, this scandal includes all that. Today, we'll address the Rampart scandal. From the formation of the Crash Unit to the current state of it today, along with its members. Yeah. All right. Welcome to Cali's Most Dangerous. Let's get into it. Chapter one. Who is the crash unit? A cop doesn't want to be in the limelight. You know, everything is about, you know, authority, power, being in control. So, I mean, everybody wants to be around money. Everybody wants to be around, you know, women. It's just, it's the nature of the badge. Los Angeles is home to a lot of prominent groups and organizations. You have top teams like the Lakers, the Dodgers, and the Kings, and some of the most prestigious universities like USC and UCLA. And it houses big tech companies like Adobe, Cisco, and Facebook. But in the background of all these amazing organizations and groups growth, something sinister was playing out. During the 1970s and 80s, gang violence, it started to hit its peak in terms of deaths and innocent victims. And a solution was needed to halt the many gangs in Los Angeles' growth. The Community Resources Against Street Hoodlums, AKA Crash, was a specialized gang intelligence unit of the Los Angeles Police Department, tasked with combating gang-related crimes between 1979 and 2000. In the 1970s, street gangs, they were quickly becoming a problem for the 77th Street Division of the Los Angeles Police Department. Located in the South Central area of Los Angeles, California. And in the 1980s, gang violence, it began to increase dramatically as a result of the drug trade, specifically with the introduction of crack cocaine. This brought a strong need and pressure on law enforcement to step up and halt the quickly climbing crime rate. And as a result of this pressure, the crash unit was birthed. With over 300 members, each of LAPD's 18 divisions had a crash unit assigned to it. And these areas range from Hollywood, South Central, Southwest, Wilshire, Rampart, and a few others. The Rampart Division of LAPD, located west of downtown Los Angeles, was the most populous area of Los Angeles and had primary Latino population. It was also one of the most busiest divisions in terms of calls for service and criminal activities. In the late 1970s and 80s, the area experienced an increase in violent crime, particularly involving gangs, drugs, and weapons. As a result, the crash unit, been heavily funded by LAPD, they operated down there like the military, moving with military-style rifles and other heavy artillery like the battering ram, which is basically a big tank with a spear attachment used to break down doors and walls during police raids. Um, that's where the driver looked through and here's the famous ram that it used to break into the houses. If you saw the movie Straight Outta Compton, the very first scene in the movie involved this battering ram. And trust, they raided more than a few houses, with gang injunctions on more than a few gangs over the years. A big example was Operation Hammer, which is a crash-led initiative that occurred in 1987 as a result of the increased gang violence and drive-by killings, resulting in deaths of seven people that year. Then Chief of Police Dale Gates 
responded by sending crash officers to arrest suspected gang members. At the height of this operation, in April of 1988, 1,453 people were arrested in a single weekend. While considered highly successful by some, this success still foreshadowed a lot of corruption to come because this operation, along with the LAPD, were mingled with accusations of racism. With some believe in Operation Hammer, it heavily employed racial profiling, targeting African Americans and Hispanic youth that were labeled as urban terrorists and ruthless killers. In addition, the beating of Rodney King by LAPD officers caused the LA riots of 1992 and put even more attention between cops and minorities in the area. Cross officers, they were required to get to know gang members, their names, habits, and friends to keep on top of gang activity. The units, they were actually successful citywide in reducing gang-related crime. But some critics believe that crash administered rough street justice, harassing and abusing suspects and falsifying reports. Even worse though, others accused crash members of being a police gang themselves. Yeah, the crash shooter name fits them well because they had more than a few crash dummies willing to do anything to gain power. So f accusations. We're about to get into how this organization is one of, if not the most corrupt in not only California, but the nation as a whole. Chapter two, one domino falls and the rest follow. I believed in the protect and serving the people. I really did. But on the inside, behind closed doors, that it wasn't the case. When it came to cops being investigated, it, we weren't serving the public the way we should have served the public. The first dumb motor to fall in a Rampart scandal was, was the incident that involved Officer Frank Liga. Liga, who had been a cop since 1986 and a detective since 1990, was assigned to the Narcotics Division. And on March 18, 1997, him and other members of his team were staking out a suspected meth dealer. Liga, he was appointed man, which required for him to send an unmarked 1990 Buick Regal waiting for a drug deal to happen so that he could follow the suspects back to their source and make the necessary arrest. After a while though, the operation was called off and Liga drove on to Ventura Boulevard. While he was stopped at a red light, a green sports utility vehicle driven by Kevin Gaines pulled up right next to him. The two made eye contact for a while and a brief argument soon followed with Liga telling Gaines to pull over for a fight. Gaines? He pulled over, but Liga drove off, so Gaines gave chase. With the SUV edging through traffic until it near Liga's car, a concerned Liga radioed to his partners for help and said he was about to use his gun. He said he saw Gaines had a gun and had threatened Liga again. Liga claimed in response, he fired two shots at Gaines. The first missed, but the second hit the driver below his right armpit, puncturing his heart before stopping in his lung. Gaines then put over into a gas station and stopped. Liga then put into the gas station and identified himself as a police officer and asked the customer coming out of the gas station's mini mart to call 911. Soon, a California Highway Patrol officer arrived, followed by Liga's captain and the officers in his stakeout team. The aftermath of the shooting. Did you intend to shoot him? I said, I hit him, didn't I? <laughs> he goes, well, it wasn't an accident. No, it wasn't an accident. He goes, do you have any regrets? I says, yeah. And he leans forward again. He goes, you regret shooting him? I says, no, I regret that he was alone in the truck at the time. Figure that one out. You know, they didn't hear that? Alone in the truck at the time. I could have killed a whole truckload of them. And would have been happily doing it. So here's the thing. Kevin Gaines, he was an officer as well. The shooting of a black officer, Gaines, by a white cop, Liga, created a highly publicized police controversy. Liga told Frontline that Gaines threatened him with a gun and that he responded in self-defense, adding, in my training experience, this guy had a I'm a gang member written all over him. Investigators in the case discovered that Gaines had allegedly been involved in similar road rage incidents, threatening drivers and brandishing his gun. They also discovered troubling connections between Gaines and Death Row Records a rap recording label owned by Marion Knight, AKA Suge Knight, that investigators came to find was hiring off-duty police officers as security guards. This situation, 
It was headlined across the nation and beyond. Retired LAPD Sergeant Cheryl Dorsey is among those who contend the voice is that of Frank Liga, a longtime LAPD narcotics detective. He was working undercover back in 1997 when he became involved in a confrontation with off-duty officer Kevin Gaines and shot and killed him. Liga contended Gaines had pointed a gun at him. The department exonerated Liga, but the city paid the Gaines family a quarter million dollar settlement. Mr. Liga's version of the facts was really inconsistent with many of the, of, of the facts that we discovered. So pressure to figure out what else internally was going wrong with LAPD's factions was at the forefront. On top of that, within months of being cleared, Liga found himself under investigation again. On March 27th of 1998, one pound of cocaine evidence booked for one of Liga's previous arrests was found missing from the Parker Center property room. Investigators eventually learned that the missing cocaine had been stolen by Rafael Perez, who they suspected at the time of targeting Liga in retaliation for the shooting of Gaines. The arrest of Perez, along with Gaines' death, will cause investigations that will lead to the Rampart Division being exposed for several other scandals. The first one, that occurred about six months prior to Gaines' death. Bank of America robbery. On August of 1997, Erlene Romero became employed at the Bank of America branch in the University of Southern California campus. On November 6, of 1997, David Mack entered the bank and claimed that he wanted to access his safety deposit box. Romero eventually admitted him into the area where he threw him to the ground and robbed the vote of $722,000. Here's the thing. In her capacity as a bank assistant manager, Romero, she wanted double the amount of usual cash on hand at the bank on the day of the robbery. After one month of investigation, Romero confessed to a role in the crime and implicated that Mac, he was the mastermind of all of it. A former track star, LAPD officer Mac, was arrested and later convicted of bank robbery. His two accomplices, they were never caught though. Mac was sentenced to 14 years and three months in prison. He refused to give the whereabouts of the money, and while in prison, he's allegedly associated himself with the Mapparu Bloods, a gang with ties to Death Row Records. Detectives investigating Mac discovered that two days after the robbery, Mac and two other police officers, including a former partner, Rafael Perez, spent the weekend gambling in Las Vegas, spending thousands of dollars. Chapter 3 How the Rampart Scandal Unfolded. Angeles Police Department is embroiled in the worst scandal in its history. Charges of police evidence tampering and perjury have led to the freeing of dozens of inmates who were wrongly accused and convicted. Prosecutors plan to ask a judge today to overturn more convictions as a result of the ongoing LAPD corruption scandal. So that now brings the total number of cases overturned to 40. Meantime, the city's dealing with a growing number of lawsuits growing out of this scandal. Several major developments today. Scandal of corruption in the division Rampart provoked that new cases criminals were annulled by a court in Los Angeles while they investigate the supposed alteration in those mismos. Los Angeles officials say it could take years to resolve the city's police corruption scandal, its worst ever. More convictions were overturned today. The city is looking at millions of dollars in legal claims by people wrongfully accused. Add another nine to the list of cases thrown out because of the LAPD corruption scandal, plus a staggering estimate of how much the resulting lawsuits could cost the city. That's a huge mess. That description of the Rampart Police corruption scandal given today by District Attorney Gil Garcetti. Nine more criminal convictions thrown out today. That makes 40 so far, including Stephen Garcia's. I lost my family, my home, cars, clothes, everything. All right, so we're about to get into a crazy timeline on how the Rampart scandal played out after all this. But first, let me give you all a quick summary of what's going on so far. After the LAPD established crash units around Los Angeles, most showed positive and early results in terms of decreasing gang violence, but only after a few years of being started, complaints started coming in from locals accusing the unit of racism and prejudiced behaviors against the locals. This prompted the early investigations of scandal within LAPD but these investigations, they really took off after the death of Kevin Gaines, the robbery David Mack took part in, and the missing cocaine from the evidence rooms. All right, so you all caught up? If not, take your ass back and watch it. I can't help you watch at this point. Anyways, fast forward to February 1998. At this point, there was a full-scale investigation going on 
and the FBI, along with other officials, were in the process of gathering more evidence. On February 26, 1998, LAPD Officer Brian Hewitt, a member of LAPD's elite anti-gang unit, crashed while 18th Street gang member Ismael Jimenez to the Rampart Police Station for questioning. Hewitt, he allegedly beat the handcuffed Jimenez in the chest and stomach, causing him to vomit blood. After being released, Jimenez went to the hospital, where officials notified the LAPD of his injuries and complaints. Subsequent internal investigations resulted in the fire of Hewitt and another officer, Ethan Cohen, who the department determined knew about but failed to report the beating. Jimenez was awarded $231,000 in a civil settlement with the city. On March 27, 1998, officials in the LAPD property room discovered that six pounds of cocaine evidence were missing. Due to prior situations and run-ins, within a week, detectives focused their investigation on LAPD officer Rafael Perez, a member of the Rampart crash unit. At the epicenter of the Rampart scandal sits Rafael Perez. His allegations of widespread corruption within LAPD specialized units, particularly the Rampart anti-crash unit, ignited what was quickly coined the worst scandal in the history of LAPD. While the true scope of the scandal, it may never be known, there's little doubt about the magnitude of the alpha of his story. With nearly over 150 convictions overturned, millions of dollars in settlement costs yet to be paid, and major police reforms, which were to be monitored by the federal court. But who is Rafael Perez? The atrocities that were committed by myself and those who stand accused are unforgivable acts. The lines between right and wrong became fuzzy and indistinct. The us against them ethos of the overzealous cop began to consume me. And the, and the end seemed to justify the means. I only vaguely sensed that we were doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. To do our job fairly was not enough. My job became an intoxicant that I lusted after. By then, I began to lust also for things of the flesh. The end result? I cheated on my wife, I cheated on my employer, and I cheated on all of you, the people of Los Angeles. Rafael Perez was born in Puerto Rico and at a young age moved to New Jersey and then Philadelphia, where after high school, he joined the Marines. He's quoted saying, as far as I can remember, I knew I wanted to be a police officer. Perez told the LA Times, he continued to say, I just didn't know what I would do when I would get there. With the marriage and military transfer, Perez landed in Los Angeles and in 1989 joined the LAPD. And originally, he was a good cop and well-liked, according to those who knew him. In the early 1990s, Perez, who went by rail on the force, began working undercover assignments on a narcotic team called Bi Team. He partnered with David Mack, the robbery suspect we already mentioned earlier, who would later be convicted of bank robbery. And the two bonded strongly, personally and professionally. Perez credited Mack with saving his life during a buy that turned deadly. In 1995, Perez joined the Rampart Anti-Gang Crash Unit. There, Perez says he discovered and eventually became immersed in a lot of police misconduct. According to Perez, he first began stealing drug money at the urging of his partner, Nino Durden. At this point, you're probably wondering how is Perez giving up all this information? But let's fast forward to mid-1998. Concerned about a possible clique of officers involved in criminal misconduct, working off duty for death row records, robbing banks, and stealing cocaine, then LAPD Chief Bernard Parks established an internal investigation task force. The investigation team, later named the Rampart Corruption Task Force, focused primarily on the prosecution of Rafael Perez. Further out of the LAPD property room, identified another pound of missing cocaine evidence that had been booked to a prior arrest made by Detective Frank Liga, the officer who had shot Kevin Gaines. At the time, investigators speculated that Perez, he may have stolen the cocaine booked by Liga in retaliation for the shooting of Gaines. This led to a criminal prosecution of Perez. Chapter four, the Rampart scandal fully exposed. 
Tonight, the terrors of worry belong to the 12-year-old son of a Salvadorian immigrant who came to the streets of LAPD's Rampart Division and had run-ins with the anti-gang officers in the crash unit, now the focus of the corruption probe. A conviction has been overturned as tainted, but two others remain in effect. And brought to the attention of INS and in federal custody, Walter Rivas may be deported before the Rampart scandal is fully sorted out. On August 25th of 1998, Perez was arrested. When first stopped and arrested by detectives, Perez asked, is this about the bank robbery? It wasn't. It was about the six pounds of missing cocaine, which investigators believed had been checked out by Perez, under another officer's name, of course, and then sold in the streets of Rampart through a girlfriend. Man, that shit doesn't get any more training aid than that. In December, Perez was brought to trial on charges of possession of cocaine with intent to sell, grand theft auto, and forgery. After five days of deliberations, the jury announced that it was hopelessly deadlocked, with the final vote of 48, favoring conviction. In preparing to bolster their case for a retrial, investigators discovered an additional 11 instances of suspicious cocaine transfers. Detectives were able to identify dose switches where Perez had ordered the cocaine evidence out of the property and replaced it with Bisquick. Yeah, the pigs, they had all the evidence they needed on the pig. Wait. No, no, I guess that's right. Yeah, the pigs had all the evidence they needed on the pig, our ex-pig Perez. So he was desperate to make a deal with him. And on September 8th of 1999, Rafael Perez made a deal with prosecutors under which he pled guilty of cocaine theft and agreed to provide prosecutors with information about two bad shootings and three other Rampart crash unit officers involved in illegal activity. In exchange, Perez received a five-year prison sentence and immunity for further prosecution of misconduct short of murder. Among his first revelations, Perez told investigators on how he and his partner Nino Durden shot, framed, and testified against Javier Avando, an unarmed gang member who was left paralyzed as a result of the incident. At the time of Perez's admission, Avando, who was paralyzed from the neck down, was in jail, serving a 23-year sentence he had received for allegedly assaulting two officers. After that admission, it began a nine-month confessional during which Perez met with investigators more than 50 times and provided more than 4,000 pages of sworn testimony. But before he was done, Perez implicated about 70 officers in misconduct, from things as serious as bad shootings to lesser things like drinking on the job. I lost my family, my home, cars, clothes, everything. Garcia says ex-Rampart police officer Rafael Perez framed him. He showed me some cocaine and told me that if I didn't give him some information on who was selling firearms or who was selling certain amounts of drugs and, and so forth, that I was going to go to prison. And At his sentencing in February of 2000, Perez marketed his version of what went wrong. He offered apologies and accepted blame. But he also blamed the, quote, intoxicant of police power. He's also quoted saying, the us against them ethos of the overzealous cop begin to consume me. And the ends justifies the means. Also, we vaguely sensed that we were going to do the wrong things for the right reasons. Time and again, I stepped over that line. Once crossed, I hurtled over it. Again and again. Landing with both feet, sometimes on innocent people. My job became an intoxicant that I lusted after. While investigators corroborated some of what Perez alleged, they have also, they say, found many inconsistencies in his statements. Over the course of the investigation, Perez's credibility had become under increased scrutiny. He filled every question on five polygraph tests, and several jailhouse informants have testified that Perez boasted of retaliating against the LAPD and burning cops that he didn't like. Investigators, they eventually came to believe that Perez had been less than truthful even kindly artful and direct in the course of the investigation. He was very self-assured and cocky, the type of person who wanted to take charge all the time, says lead detective Brian Tandle. We knew he was admitted at the time liar, perjurer. We knew he was a thief. He was a con. That's the best way of probably describing him, the best word I could use. You can't trust Rafael Perez, says the then department DA Richard Rosenthal, who prosecuted Perez and said in most of the debriefings. He's a perjurer. He's a dope dealer. He's a thief. Among any other adjectives you can come up with, 
that have negatively described his character. He was also quoted saying, on September 16th of 1999, with Perez recanted his 1996 testimony about the shooting of Javier Vando, the district attorney's office filed papers seeking to overturn his conviction. Ivano was released from prison after serving two and a half years. Based upon Perez's allegation of wrong for arrest and investigations by the task force, nearly 100 more convictions were eventually overturned. In the largest police misconduct settlement in police history, Javier Vando was awarded $15 million. Also, 29 civil suits were settled for nearly $11 million. In addition, the city, they faced more than 100 more civil suits stemming from the corruption scandal, with estimates that the total settlement cost will be about $125 million. Yeah, tax money spent well. On September 21st, 1999, LAPD Chief Bernard Parks formed a board of inquiry comprised of LAPD command staff to analyze management failures and investigate the death of the corruption scandal. The board's report, released in March 2000, blames in large measure lax departmental management for allowing misconduct within the Rampart Division to occur. Chapter 5 After the Rampart crash unit scandal was exposed, a lot of cops and other officials were arrested and ultimately went down as well. And by March 3rd, 2000, LAPD Chief Bernard Parks announced that he was disbanding the department's crash units and creating a new anti-gang unit that would include more rigorous requirements for membership, stressing the officer's level of experience. In the following months of the scandal, the police commission, they formed a Rampart Independent Review Panel, comprised of citizens, including attorneys, educators, and business executives. The panel issued a report in November 2000, with 72 findings and 86 recommendations. It concluded that officers needed better and more supervision, and that the LAPD is viewed by the community as excessively hostile and confrontational. Also, on July 28th of 2000, Perez partner Lino Durden was arrested and charged with attempted murder for the shooting of Javier Vando. He was also charged with perjury, filing false police reports, and robbery. The following year, on March 30th of 2001, Perez's former partner Lino Durden cut a deal with state and federal prosecutors in which he agreed to plead guilty to 10 state and federal charges, including fabricated evidence, false arrests, and presenting false testimony and was sentenced to eight years in prison. With his deal, also requiring that he fully cooperate with federal prosecutors, who, using daughter's testimony, brought additional indictments against Rafael Perez. A professor at USC released an analysis of the LAPD's Board of Patrol, Board of Inquiry Report. He concluded that the LAPD minimized the magnitude of the Rampart scandal and failed to acknowledge the extent to which its internal culture allowed corruption to fester. By September 19 of that year, the Los Angeles City Council voted 10 to 2 to accept the consent decree allowing a federal judge acting on behalf of the U.S. Department of Justice to oversee and monitor reforms within the LAPD for a period of five years. Also, on October 4th, in the first criminal case stemming from Perez's allegations, Sergeant Edward Ortez, Brian Liddy, Paul Harper, and Michael Buchanan, all of whom were in a Rampart unit, were tried on charges of perjury, fabricating arrests, and filing false police reports. Perez, however, he didn't testify at trial due to concerns about his credibility. All four officers pleaded guilty, and on November 15th, Ortez, Liddy, and Buchanan were convicted of conspiracy to obstruct justice and filing police reports, while Harper, he was acquitted of all charges. On July 4th, 2001, after serving three years of his five-year sentence, Perez was released from prison and placed on parole. Los Angeles Superior Court Judge Robert Perry ruled that due to safety concerns, Perez would serve as parole outside of the state of California. But nah, you actually can still see Perez around Los Angeles. The last time he was recorded in public, he was working as a limo driver. Chapter 6. Where do the scandalous LAPD officers and beyond stand today? Gangs in Los Angeles and the LAPD they don't have a lot of things in common. Their members, they operate completely different from each other. With cops preaching, protecting and serving, and gangbangers preaching, where you from? Or what set you been? Cops, they can hide behind a badge when confronted. Gang members, they gotta go and hide. But the one thing that they do have in common is the need for some of those members 
to be so thirsty for power that they're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. Whether it's dealing drugs, killing innocent people, or extorting the community. In the Rampart scandal, it exposed that there's definitely some members in LAPD who did all that and much more to gain power. You still don't believe that? Here's a few more facts about the Rampart scandal that you probably didn't know. Crash cops had gang-like initiation rituals and power structures. The cops who formed the crash unit were able to get away with their offenses because they created an insulated membership that avoided oversight from the LAPD leadership structure. To join crash, an officer needed an existing member of the unit to sponsor him. This ensured compromised officers to choose like-minded individuals for the unit. Once a part of crash, the cops had to prove their loyalty by planting evidence on suspects and were monitored to ensure they didn't snitch and turn against their fellow officers. Overall, the Rampart Division had a notorious reputation within the department as an entirely dishonorable section. Thus, honest cops requested to be transferred out of division while the bad cops flooded the ranks. The officers reduced crime in their division, but once again, the brutal tactics and unauthorized activities undermined any success that they might have had. One member of an underground organization said that Crash, it was basically like an organization that was created like a gang. While it may seem that a member of an unlawful group comparing the police to offenders is cliche, officers in a unit will get tattoos commemorating targets dispatched in the line of duty, and they use covert symbols to identify themselves in the same way gangs do. The officers they also may have been involved in notorious B.I.G.'s passing. When it was like halfway down, so I was looking out the window, you just see a car pull up on big door, like pull up on big door and no words, just a single dude in the car and he just fired shots inside the door. When we saw it, we just, everybody got down in the car. Everybody been down, just hit the shots, just ringing in the car. But no window busting or nothing, nobody screamed, big ain't screaming. He didn't say, ouch. Oh, we got a gun, nothing. On March 9th, 1997, rapper Notorious B.I.G. was leaving a party while visiting Los Angeles when he was shot in the car. His case is going on soft for over 20 years, but one theory holds that the LAPD and the Rampart officers were involved in the plot to terminate Biggie Smalls. According to the Tupac documentary, Assassinations, The Battle for Compton, citing official legal documents, a reliable jail enforcement by the name of Kim Bugani who befriended Raphael in prison, stated Perez claimed the money stolen in the bank robbery was intended to go to Harry Billups, also known as Amari Muhammad, who was friends with Mac, for allegedly carrying out the murder of the late rapper Christopher Wallace, also known as Biggie Small. The rapper's mother was so convinced that police were involved, she filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the department on grounds that police officer David Mack and Death Row Records owner Suge Knight planned the takedown. Another wild fact we didn't mention, officers also terminated an unarmed man and they also planted a gun on him as well. One of the most disturbing revelations the scandal uncovered involved the death of Juan Salander, who police terminated in 1996. According to Rafael Perez, crash shooting officers stormed up an apartment building looking for underground members involved in the drive-by. When the officers entered the building, there was a standoff with the police and the men inside, and the officers ended up shooting two men and ended up killing one. 21 year old Juan Salander, whom they struck in the back. Police claimed Salander had a firearm, but officer turned witness Perez said they planted evidence on him while he left bleeding rather than calling an ambulance in order to justify the occurrence. Another fact Rampart crashed in officers, beat, and unlawfully detained innocent people. Sometimes breaking a law also means breaking arms, legs, or whatever. And several Rampart scandal cops did exactly that. Rampart officers practiced intimidation, unauthorized detention, physical aggression, and intimidation of gang members, even when they were not accused of any offense and when there was no justification for detaining them. In one case, Gabriel Aguirre, an alleged gang member, accused officers Rafael Perez and Ethan Cohen of breaking his arm. Another man, SBL Jimenez, accused Officer Brian Hewitt of beating him so severely while he was restrained that he vomited blood. Jimenez said the officer targeted him because he didn't want to give him an untraceable gun. Another fact 
that truth at least to be widely known at this point is that the LAPD ruined the lives of complete innocent people, not just gang members. While some of the people ensnared in a web of double dealing, evidence planning, and substance dealing were known gang members, crash officers also brought cases against totally innocent people that ruined their lives. For example, Israel Carrillo, he lost his green card and he was deported when officers planted a firearm on him. He also served 18 months in prison for offense he didn't even commit. A warehouse worker working minimum wage, Nestor Zatino, also had one planted on him and racked up tens of thousands of dollars in legal fees for his freedom and the right to stand in his adopted country. Others lost their life savings, homes, and were forced into drug programs they didn't need. Once an honor student with a bright future, Miguel Fuentes was wrongfully deported to Mexico and has a stand on his name after being duped by police into pleading guilty for a possession charge for drugs he wasn't carrying. These and hundreds of other lives were ruined, needlessly by overzealous cops who claimed their heavy-handed tactics were needed to clean up the city, when they really destroyed the lives of those they were sworn to protect. In addition, the scandal it sparked a lot of changes within the LAPD. With the scandal, it also sparked reforms that were long overdue. The Rampart scandal it has its roots in a response from the LAPD to the 1992 LA riots, or what civil rights activists like to call the LA Uprising. Before the uprising, police used aggressive tactics and escalated situations rather than trying to defuse them. The police, they wrote endless citations for minor offenses rather than giving warnings, and they regularly impounded cars in one of the poorest neighborhoods in Los Angeles. These aggressive tactics, they were promoted by then Chief of Police, Daryl Gates. Because of this, tensions were at their highest in South Central Los Angeles, when four officers were acquitted for severely beating Rodney King. At that point, the people rose up against the police. The city in turn exploded with long simmering tension over the racial oppression, the disappearance of working class jobs in the area, and a police force led by a chief who joked that he was glad the light was good in the Rodney King video. The uprising left 50 people deceased and countless buildings burnt down to the ground, but didn't lead to a much needed reform on how law enforcement policed the city. Overall, the Rampart scandal, it shut up the LAPD it was incapable of reforming itself. Only after dozens of officers were implicated in drug sales, theft, and falsifying evidence did the federal government step up and require the department to monitor the officers' behavior. That, along with the mayor committed to reform the city and civil groups working with the police to change the department, led to a much more harmonious relationship between law enforcement and citizens. This scandal, it was widely known across the nation with the media covering pretty much every event that took place. In addition, the Rampart scandal was so prevalent that it inspired several Hollywood films. Cop movies are Hollywood's bread and butter, and little was seen more tailor-made for the scream than the Rampart scandal. It had just about everything. An underhanded cop gambling away ill-gotten gangs in Las Vegas, cool cars, Snoop Dogg, police officers, and gang members colluding with nefarious activities, Cops were taken in drugs and general miscarriages of justice by those who should be ultimately protecting society. The Rampart scandal and inspired films such as Training Day and Street Kings. In fact, Rafael Perez influenced the performance of Denzel Washington in Training Day as a fast talking, persuasive cop disguised in a lot of malice. Yeah, the Rampart scandal, it had a lasting effect on the perception of LAPD. For years, locals complained about the LAPD's activities and harsh behaviors towards them but had little or no response. But this scandal brought everything to the forefront. But wait, don't think these activities are just limited to Los Angeles, or even California for that matter. There have been more than a few scandals around the nation, including another big state like Arizona, Phoenix to be exact. And if you don't think their situation was as bad as the Rampart scandal, you definitely gotta stick around for the upcoming facts. Chapter seven, a timeline of Phoenix's police's wild scandals. Phoenix police SUVs swarmed the area. One of their own was alive, but Romaine Brisbane is dead. 
I'm not a very emotional person, but uh, when a close friend dies, you know, I mean, this is wrong. Friends bring flowers to the scene to memorialize the father. He was trying to feed his kids. He bring his kids food. I went with him. He went in the house and he got shot. He didn't have a weapon. Finney's police chief, Jay Williams, had to do a lot of damage control after hundreds of questionable Facebook posts from Finney's police officers surfaced online. The 282 posts from 97 current and former Phoenix cops show officers frequently refer to blacks as thugs, call for violence against protesters, denounce Muslims as and joked about refusing to help citizens who criticize the police. A new Phoenix Times investigation found four of the officers whose posts were included in the database had also been accused of killing people. While the head of the Phoenix police union dismissed the criticism as a hunt for negative spin, that failed to mention officers' positive posts, it's far from the only scandal to hit the Phoenix area. In 2007, Phoenix cop Richard Chrisman shot and killed a man and his dog for no reason. Richard Chrisman, a nine-year veteran of the Phoenix Police Department, shot and killed 28-year-old Danny Rodriguez and Rodriguez's dog for no reason at all in 2007. Responding to a 911 call by Rodriguez's mom, Crispin went haywire when questioned by the suspect, pulling out his gun and putting it to Rodriguez's head and yelling, I don't need no warrant, motherfucker. The confrontation ended with Rodriguez and his dog, unfortunately, dead on the floor. Crispin's partner, who was at the scene and watched Crispin murder Rodriguez, testified at trial. And Crispin only received a seven year prison sentence. Also, in June of 2010, Phoenix police officer James Wren was charged with shaking down drug dealers. The Avondale Police Department contacted Phoenix Police to say one of its officers, a 23-year-old James Wynn, was using traffic stops to steal money from drug dealers. Avondale Police got a tip from an informant who claimed he had conducted two operations with Wren where the informant would lead the officer to cars of drug dealers after a deal had been made. Wren, according to the informant, would then pull over the car and steal the money. In one instance, according to court documents, Wren pulled over a drug dealer stole his money, then threw his car keys in the desert before releasing him. But all his schemes, they came to an end. When Ren stopped somebody he thought was a drug dealer who had $40,000 in cash. The alleged drug dealer, he was actually an undercover Phoenix police officer. By the end of that year, complaints of some of the officers being crooked became so overwhelming that it jump-started several investigations. Because of this, by November of 2010, 25 officers were investigated for fraud. Phoenix Police Chief Jack Harris insisted that the police department is not a corrupt organization, as he explained the department's role in the investigation of three police officers. In total, 25 officers within the department were investigated by the Attorney General's office for what basically boils down to a time theft scam. In addition, though, in a scandal similar to ex-officer Raphael, in March of 2011, a detective stole thousands of oxycodone pills. According to the police, the detective was still oxycodone that was supposed to be destroyed. As if nobody would notice, the detective would replace it with over-the-counter pain reliever, a leave. Cops became hip to the detective scam after conducting a routine audit of the stored evidence. They suspected that in total, the detective tampered with 83 evidence bags and stole about 2,400 pills. Police officers in a betrayal of trust accused of going behind their own department's back, exposing undercover cops to the very people that were being investigated. But this may not be the first time their ethics and loyalty have been called into question. In August of 2011, former Phoenix Mayor Bill Gordon's son, Phoenix Police Officer Jeff Gordon, received a four-day suspension for having oral sex while on duty. Some might say they're enemies from within. Two disgraced former Phoenix cops accused of tipping off employees and customers at a strip club about their own department's undercover drug sting. And the internal documents that we were able to obtain show they've been in the hot seat before. And if you didn't think it got more crazier than that, in 2012, Phoenix detective Chris Wilson was sentenced to 23 years in prison for sexually assaulting teenage boys. Former Phoenix police officer Christopher Wilson was sentenced to 23 years in prison and a lifetime of probation after pleading guilty last month, just moments before his trial was slated to begin. Wilson, who had served for the Phoenix Police Department for 13 years and also served in the U.S. Navy, acted as the department's community liaison to the Valley's lesbian, gay, 
bisexual, and transgender community. He was arrested in August of 2012 and charged with sex crimes involving minors he had met through the department. Wilson pleaded guilty to two counts of sexual misconduct with the minor and one count of attempting to commit sexual misconduct with the minor. The victims, they're only 17 and 14 years old. Trust. There was a lot of other insane shit going on over the years in Phoenix, but in June of 2017, Phoenix settled a lawsuit with the family of an unknown black man killed by Phoenix police for $1.5 million. Police say Brisbane and his SUV matched the description of a suspected drug dealer. When confronted, there was a struggle. Brisbane reached into his pocket, the officer reaching in two and believed Brisbane was clenching a gun. The officer fired twice into Brisbane's torso. Remain Bisbon had put into the parking lot of his North Phoenix apartment complex in December of 2014 and gotten out of the car when a police officer confronted him. What happens next is disputed. The police officer, Mark Wine, has claimed that Bryson reached for his waistband after being told to put his hands up, then started to run away. A struggle ensued, and Wine, who said he thought he filled a gun in Bryson's pocket, fired two shots in self-defense. Two witnesses, Bryce Bond's friend Brandon Dickerson, who had been sitting in his car, and Danny Klinger, his girlfriend, tell a completely different story. They argue that Ray had no probable cause to detain or arrest Bryce Bond. We need to look into that. We need to take a deeper dive into why police officers are feeling compelled to shoot and kill as opposed to apprehend and detain, arrest, and jail. Well, going out to pick up food at McDonald's for his girlfriend and her 18-month-old daughter. The Fair City Council approved a 1.5 million payment to Bryce Bond's family, selling the claims filed on behalf of his mother, girlfriend, and children. Police say they understand the heightened sensitivity given the recent events across the country. We always have been and always will be concerned about what it is that our residents think about our role in this community and the levels of force that we use. All we can do is provide the details and share them with people in hopes that they understand the type and the nature of the job that our officer was trying to do last night. Yeah, Phoenix was known for doing a lot of shooting. Matter of fact, in 2018, Phoenix police shot a record number of people that year. More people than the NYPD or the LAPD, the two biggest police forces in the country. The high number itself may not constitute misconduct, but the reasons for the daily trend remain unknown. The Phoenix Police Department released an independent report on that year's number of officer-involved shootings, which had more than doubled in 2017 and ranked among the highest in the country. Those who want a clear answer on why the police shot so many people will be disappointed. The report, it didn't point out any definite cause for the 44 police shootings in 2018, 23 of which were fatal, but identifies a significant increase in shootings involving armed individuals and people assaulting cops with deadly weapons. Chapter 8. Current State of the LAPD The crash unit has been dismantled for over two decades, with most of the convicted officers being fired from the force and serving prison time. The main officers who the Rampart scanner centered around served their time and relocated to other states. Rafael Perez, however, like I already mentioned, remained in Los Angeles. He's been spotted recently driving a limo server. It kind of shows you the full circle power of karma. You can be on top of the world and have everything. But if you're operating with a self-serving agenda, we're supposed to be protecting and serving the people. You can have everything snatched away from you in the blink of an eye. The LAPD was still able to maintain a healthy police force in terms of membership, but recently, the LAPD has lost nearly a thousand officers. In 2010, the Los Angeles Police Department celebrated an historic hiring milestone, announcing that the city had reached a target set out by at least two mayors and multiple police chiefs. 10,000 police officers, with most of the growth happening during a global recession that ravaged the city's finances. Now, within a three year span, those gains have been erased. Police Chief Michael Moore reported that the sworn staffing had fallen to 9,103, down nearly 1,000 from 2019. The drop of LAPD staffing could be traced to 2020. The year City Hall was hit by a major budget crisis, one triggered by COVID-19 shutdown, and massive street protests over George Floyd's murder. Demonstrators were demanding that the city funds be shifted away from the police and into social services. 
In the years that followed the Rampart scandal, there's been several other corrupt officers and scandals, but the fact remains that there hasn't been a police unit or force as violent and corrupt as a Rampart crash unit. Y'all stay safe for dangers out there.